Kagawa, co-founder of Castagra. I'm always Alex. That's my Starbucks name. He was uh, creating a molding product and he sold that to a large company, but he accidentally created a coating. It's... Commercial roofing is boring. We had uh, $100,000 from Pepsi that sponsored the competitions. We were coating inside of water tanks and then 2014 hit for us. What's dying or have to die in the roofing industry? It doesn't matter if you go down or if this company fails, you have to keep taking your shots every single day. You can take something that's new and run as fast as you can, or you can spend 20 years in trying to become an expert. You have to keep changing things up. You have to keep things interesting. You have to keep testing things. Make the effort to find someone close to you in your organization. How do you compete with someone that has a reach? Uh, is seven o'clock good time for you? Yeah, it's fine, seven o'clock. So we want to do interviews from like six to eight, nine. We have someone at six. Yeah. So if you come at seven, yeah. just uh, be down in the lobby at Trump Hotel. Okay. We'll come get you okay. up. We're going to have a studio set up and everything. Sure. We'll come talk business. Come on in, man. We're going to be right here. So, I mean, you, you can enjoy the view if you want to take a look. Uh, we're going to mic you up. You're so shy, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope we will we'll change that in a second. We will have fun for it. I know. <laughs> What's up, insiders? Today I have a very special treat for you. I have one of the most optimistic and positive people in the entire roofing industry. I'm telling you, I've been following this guy on LinkedIn. I've never seen any negative energy. He's so positive, so awesome. But I want to start with this because there's no way I can pronounce your name. And it, he made it easy for all of us. I've never seen this feature activated on any other profile. Here's his name. Katsuya Nakagawa, co-founder of Castagra, we manufacture high adhesion roof coatings. I mean, you won the LinkedIn. This, this is perfect. Why did you decide to not only record your name, but what you do? Uh, I wanted always to make it easier for people to uh, pronounce my name. So first of all, I've shortened the name to Tats, right? And I, I know when I was growing up, I, I lived in an area where there wasn't that many Japanese people and my name would get butchered, and people would call me things I don't want to hear. So I thought, you know what? I got to control my own destiny. So I came up with Tats. It's, it, Tatsu is a shorter form of my Japanese name. I say Tats, and it stuck. So I just kept using that, and they still butcher my last name, Nakagawa. Okay. But you know what? You know, Tats has uh, helped me out. And, and that LinkedIn feature, I think if anyone has a name that gets mispronounced, they should record an audio clip to help people so they when they're doing intros to podcasts or you know calling their name they can they can uh, you know say I, I want to hear from my audience if you have a hard to pronounce name when you go to Starbucks or McDonald's and you t give them your name do you give them your name or a made up name I'm always Alex that's my Starbucks name because when I tell people Dimitri I have to spell I have to work too hard Dimitri Dimitri they butcher it like crazy everybody can spell Alex so I made it simple, Alex Sky. It's my stage name. I actually use it online in some chats and stuff. Uh, Sky, because it's Lipinski, just took last three words, but I love it. But I, comment below if you do have changed name. Why didn't you change the last name since it's so hard for everyone? Um, I mean, Nakagawa, I mean, it's, you know, very common Japanese name. And, you know, I, I do like that name, but I think, you know, most people, I, you know, I, I just, Give them off, get, get them right off the hook and say tats. You don't have to memorize anything else. And uh, it's, it's worked for me, so. How fluent are you in Japanese? Wow, um, I was good enough to sort of work some Japanese clients when I had my agency business. Okay. But when it starts to get to a little trickier language, you know, I, I start to fall down, so. But my sister is, you know, lives there and she's, she's fantastic at it. Okay. Uh, as far as a roofing in Japan goes, have you ever looked into Japanese roofing system, roofing market? Because what they do there, it's completely different what we do here. Do, do you see any trend for technologies over there? Because Japanese is a pretty advanced country. And what do they do as far as roofing goes? 
Yeah, you know, I haven't really looked into the Japanese market because I, I, you know, I came here when I was three,、yeah. and you know, my mindset has always been North America, and、yeah. I know、um, Japan has, you know, I, I love the culture. When I go there, I feel excited. But one thing about me is I've always been entrepreneurial, like it or not, right? Before it was trendy to say that you were an entrepreneur. And before, when you tell, told people you're an entrepreneur, they look at you like you haven't found a job yet. And,、um, but in Japan, the entrepreneurship side of it is not as cultivated as North America. So I've never really thought about going back or staying for extended periods. I always loved、uh, North America. But you've been back, right? Yeah, my, my mom used to work for Japan Airlines. So we used to go back every year. And I have cousins and family that live over there. So. See, very well. Let's talk about your entrepreneurial journey here. You have a pretty big portfolio. How did you end up in the roofing and specifically with this particular product? Wow, I never、uh, ever thought、um, I'd make it to the roofing industry. And yes, I do have a show. I keep asking people that question. But、uh, if I go back to sort of entrepreneurial side, I remember、uh, 10 years old, when I was 10 years old, I had a friend that had a pear tree in his backyard. And I had this idea where I said, well, why don't we take those pears and sell them? So we found this location that was in front of a convenience store that didn't sell fruit. It was right next to a bus station. And we set up this really horrible looking table and these ugly looking pears. And you know, it, two、How、of us, 10, 10, 10. And we're out there trying to sell these pears. And weren't, we weren't very successful. But there was a guy and a girlfriend that came up to our table, looked at us, and said, I love entrepreneurs. He opened his wallet, pulled out a $20 bill, and gave it to us. And for us, that was a million dollars, right? That is a million dollars. You know, we had a bad idea. You know, it wasn't even executed well, but just because we tried, we got an opportunity. And、mm. I love that idea of you know, being able to take an idea out of thin air and try to make it into something. Talk to me about your product that you sell today, how it was born. And I want to hear the story. I just watched your TikTok. On the story of Dragon Show you know, in Canada. Let's talk about it. When I was in university, I knew I needed a mentor. So,、uh, luckily, a friend of mine introduced me a guy named Peter Rosen. He invented the Windows Media Player. He worked on some early 3D printing technology.、Wow. And he also created a steel measurement technology that later inspired the MRI. So, I worked for him for free. Like, I was How like.、Long? Uh, a year, but we started to develop a relationship and we started to do projects together, and that turned into some small companies on the marketing side.、Wow. And I, I learned a lot. Like when you're going out there to try to help do you know,、uh, new products and to launch them, there's a steep learning curve. In the very beginning, I was very, very bad at it. But after doing you know, 10, 20, 40, you know, we did about 70% of the consumer products. 30% industrial. How do you create it? Like, what's the process? Guide me through it. So, how do you start? Do you start with a problem to solve or with an idea? Or like- well, I think ideally you want to start with trying to get, have a piece of insight, right? You see something in the marketplace, you don't spend a b- bunch of money to create it. But in reality, in many situations, when I was running the agency, people would come with something, and this is the best thing in the world, right? Everyone had. His idea is the best thing in the world, but they haven't properly validated it.、Mm-hmm. So, there's something I learned early on. It was called the 3 a.m. test. And the 3 a.m. test works like this. So, let's say you have an idea. So, visualize that you're going to go to an you know, imaginary prospect's house at 3 in the morning. So, you show up at their house, you bang on their door, right? It's not opening. So, you kick the door down and you run upstairs. You, you, You、uh, ram open the bedroom door, you grab them, and you shake them. You say, Wake up, wake up. I had the best idea ever. This is 3 a.m. And you go, Blah. And that prospect or that client or that person is going to do one of two things. They're going to get super excited with you, and they're going to stay up all night, and gonna, you're going to talk about it, and they're going to look like, or they're going to look at you and say, You're a weirdo, and you go to sleep. So 3 a.m. Yeah. So there's. You know, a burden to have something really exciting. Everyone thinks it's great, but you really have to test it to really understand if you have something. Do you see a lot of products in the roofing industry that's failing? Because I see them, you go to a lot of experts, I go to a lot of experts, and you kind of see、uh, how、uh, Laura from Shark Tank says, hero or zero. 
and you can see those products. And yeah. unfortunately, they didn't go to investors to hear hear from them that there are zeros. They go to expos to you know show the world their product, and a lot of products suck because they're not exciting. I mean, they I've seen so many products even review them, even interview them, and people tell me how exciting they are. You know, like. The problem they solve is so little or they don't solve problem at all. Yeah. So everybody laughs and it's devastating probably for entrepreneurs. How many products you've been part of that didn't work out? Wow, a lot of them. And some of them, when they show up at the desk, in the beginning, I thought, you know, try to do everything I can. But at the end, I was literally trying to convince people out of it. And definitely that's not a good way to you know, grow a business. And one of the things I learned, you know, and some of these ones were successful, was the fact that they did the upfront homework before that they uh, they built it or they had a great distribution channel. They had some piece of the puzzle, right? They had that expertise. They had that humility and willingness to learn. It increases the chance of success, but you can't rule everything out. You know, I remember uh, interviewing uh, a guy named Jeffrey Moore, who is like one of the world's experts in launching products. He's he's an advisor to Microsoft you know, Salesforce, Autodesk, and I asked him, I said, I do this and this and this, and I usually get to a point where there's three really good looking paths, and what do I do? I asked this guy, and he looks at me, he smiles and says, at some point you have to roll the dice. So there's only so much you can do, and I think that's the fun of it and also the terrifying part of it, is you just have to give it a try. And, you know, if your heart is in the right place and you have the, the team with you, then you have a fair chance of giving it a go. It's very interesting. Uh, I would also compare it to creating content. Sometimes what do you think is a good content? What's good content for you? You, you hope like, oh, it's a good idea, it's a good video, it's whatever. So you throw it and it just tanks. And if you, uh, I come from different background now. I, I, I talk to a lot of YouTubers and creators and they will tell you that, you know, guys like Mr. Beast, like the most popular YouTubers, that a lot of their success was spontaneous, not expected. Try, mm -hmm. you know, they will do 100 videos, nothing mm -hmm. happened. They do one-on-one one -on -one accidentally. Like, as a matter of fact, my number one video on my YouTube channel, you know, it was just discipline to make. I'm like, I remember t to this day how I made it. It wasn't genius idea. I'm like, okay, I have to make a video. And it was um, September or August, and I'm like, Okay, leaves are falling. I have to make videos about gutter covers. So I literally went to Home Depot and Lowe's and Menards and picked seven, eight products and just reviewed them. It took me like two hours from idea to filming to give it to my video guy to publish. Yeah. I had like a million views on that video. And all it was like, hey guys, in this video, I will review products, best and worst gutter covers from yeah. big box stores. So you never know, but there is signs. Do you see failing products in the roofing? Did you see failing products in this expo today? Well, we're, we're, we're in Las Vegas at the Western Expo. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't specifically looking at, uh, for evaluation, but I, typically the signs are their marketing uh, material are underdeveloped or they start talking about the too much of the technical side and they're not asking the questions to the contractors. That's interesting you mentioned it. What makes it, why is it a problem when people talk too much about technical side? Well, it, it's not a problem if they were a roofer or they were solving that problem, right? If they're their own customer, you know, I love stories like this. I was a contractor and, you know, I always used to come up with this problem and then I went to every distributor, every manufacturer and no one had a solution. And if the economics are right there, then that's, that leads to something, right? Mm -hmm. But the skills to get from end to end, you know, you run your own business. Mm -hmm. Like entrepreneurship exposes every weakness, right? That you can mm -hmm. possibly have. And you have to face all those fears and those weaknesses. And that's the fun of it. But that's also the thing that says that, you know, 90% plus people shouldn't be doing it, right? So um, I, I look at those signs, like how, if, you, if you ask them a question, could they recite a book about it, about the market, the need, how deep are they? Are they very superficial with it, right? Or, or, or could they go on and on and on about the specific and connect with the contractor on that level? So those are the signs that you know, they might have something. Got it. Let's talk about your product and your journey. Uh, I want to hear everything from the early on. How did you join that company? How did you guys launch it? And give me the full story 
from you know Dragon Show and everything else. Sure, absolutely. Dragon Den. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, here here we are launching all these products, and I started to get you know uh, some of the stuff I really wasn't excited about helping, and I needed better alignment. And you know, I'm in my I was in my uh, late. 30s and, and you know kids and starting to think about you know, what impact I am you know having on the world and am I doing something meaningful and I remembered that Peter you know he's my business partner that uh, it, he invented something by accident 20 years earlier right so it was he was uh, creating a molding product and he sold that to a large company but he accidentally created a coating right and the coating had very unique properties he coated marine ships he coated um, roofs, he coated floors, he did all sorts of trials and he and sold a bunch too, but he got bored and he started to do how, how did he create it by accident? Mixing stuff or? Absolutely. So uh, one of his friends was a carpenter and, you know, in the late 80s, one of the big problems was the high-end homes had curved walls and especially these curved staircases and these baseboards were wooden. So essentially these carpenters would have to cut these, the baseboard, the wooden ones into Lego sized pieces mm -hmm. and try to reassemble them. It was hard work. It looked terrible. And, you know, he, uh, he knew that, you know, Peter was an inventor. So he came to him and say, Hey, please solve this problem. So he developed a, you know, caster gypsum based, you know, flexible molding, which is very common now mm -hmm. that went uh, along the bottom. It was sustainable. It could be nailable and paintable. In the process of him developing that, right, you know, that went on to uh, sell a ton. He, you know, he was while he was doing his experimentation, he developed the coating. So, wow. you know, it's just like you know WD forty or the microwave. It's just a complete coincidence that the uh, properties of the waterproofing, the the recoat window, and all those things were lined up to be applicable to roofing and some of the other markets that. We participated. So that's how Castagra uh, was born? Absolutely. So I asked them, would you want to do it again? So I got them excited about that. And what happened is, you know, like you said, you know, luck is at the same time Dragon's Den was hosting a competition and they were trying to find the best sustainable innovation in Canada. And I said, why don't we enter, right? I, and the, our problem was... Were you in Canada at the time? Yeah, yeah. We were in Canada at the time. And the problem was, how do you make coatings look cool on TV, right? Because although they're looking for good innovations, it still has to look good it's on TV. Boring. It's Commercial roofing is boring. <laughs> so how do we make it look interesting, right? So we're racking our, our head over it and we said, why don't we do a cooking show? So, you know, a, a pan, a nonstick pan, you know, mix the coatings, pour it on, it sticks, wow. And it, it convinced the judges. And we yes, also, nothing sticks to, to the pan, right? Yeah, I mean, no. I, yeah, the, I mean, it, you know, we, you know, we uh, definitely... So you, you created anti-infomercial. <laughs> so infomercials create, uh, you know, pans that nothing sticks to them. And you're like, no, we're going to destroy you with our product. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, obviously we didn't select the $500 pan that nothing really sticks to. Sure. We went with a more economical one, but it proved the point that it was doing something very unique in the market and it, it gave us you know uh, so much exposure right this is before you know uh, youtube TikTok. was coming up and TikTok and stuff like that you know we got 12 million views we had a uh, hundred thousand dollars from pepsi that sponsored the competitions all the celebrity judges including kevin o'leary robert hercevic you know made offers and you know we we sort of put them aside raised some money privately and we so, launched so the company. you didn't take their money it, we, we, you know, we was debating over it, but I mean, obviously they want certain things and we felt that, you know, with the coding market that we needed expertise within the industry. And I think if it was a consumer product, I think we would have jumped in and possibly work with those people because I think being spokesperson in, in those markets is very, very powerful. But it, B2B or industrial, it doesn't hold the same, you know, weight because you really have to solve a problem for a contractor, right? So I think that that was our choice. And looking back, although we were very, very grateful of the opportunity there, um, it was the right choice for us. Seems to me that a lot of people are using Shark Tank, Dragon's Den for publicity. They hate it. They call it out all the time, right? But many companies go there for publicity. I'm actually thinking about going there myself. You should. <laughs> yeah, with the directory. But I, I'm applying. Yeah.
No, that's that's very good, and and I think obviously for us, you know, when we got into the the coding industry, one our uh, director of sales who's still with us as biz dev, he had a, a lot of oil and gas contacts, mm -hmm. so he got us into the oil and gas market for coatings, and that's a tough market. But you know, we were doing work for those very large oil companies like Halliburton and, and Cadet. What did you do for them? Uh, internal t tank lining. Talk about a niche market right wow. the inside the tank in some cases the bottom third basically with with the chemicals in there they separate so that the you know the the sort of uh, sort of uh, acidic stuff is sitting at the bottom so that bottom portion of the tank needs um, you know coatings so we were in there coating the inside of that we were coating the inside of water tanks and then 2014 hit for us which is you know uh, the price of oil tanked so I feel, I know, you know, through the pandemic, you know, we were, we were fairly lucky, but during that period in 2014, our sales tanked about 80% in 45, 60 days. Wow. You know, large companies were not paying their bill, delaying the bill, you know, canceling firm POs. I mean, you know, we were shocked. I was shocked. You know, I've, I've, at that point, I've been an entrepreneur for a while. We're running, you know, small businesses, but, you know, it, it, you know, you're starting to think of how embarrassing it is. And, it, you know, it's, although it's not under your control, you know, what are you going to do, right? You know, you have this, you know, blank look on your face. And I distinctly uh, remember I was calling a, a mentor of mine that went through someone, something similar. And he said something to me that I'll never forget. He said, you know, what's, what's your biggest priority? And I said, oh, or, or next thing that you have to work on, this thing. Well, what's the next thing you have to work on after that? I, I said this thing over here and I, he says keep doing it and I think what happens is when we have such a big problem we get in paralysis because we're used to you know having one or two actions that can solve problems but if we did the next 20 things perfectly we may not solve this problem so you're, you're grasping at straws trying to find a solution and you know what his point was don't stop Right? It doesn't matter if you go down or if this company fails, you have to keep taking your shots every single day. Right? And we got lucky. You know? We got lucky with a few things, with some projects, and we were able to pivot into flooring. And particularly in 2014 to 2016 was the early days of the cannabis market. So the cannabis market, you know, there was a lot of regulations that were just starting to turn over. And what happened was, um, you know, w w we found that, you know, through our uh, biz dev activity, that there may be an opportunity there. And the larger companies, you know, they were trying to protect their brand because they didn't know how the public was going to perceive them, you know, doing floors for the cannabis industry. But we were half dead and we had no reputation or no brand to lose. So, you know, who knows? You know, all, we're coding floors, regulations are coming, we're plant-based, we're sustainable, let's go in there. And uh, it was so a big... So you, you are plant-based? Yeah, plant-based, yeah, caster-based, yeah. Oh. And we, uh, we went in there and started coding floors. And for a year and a half, we had a virtual monopoly. We showed up at the trade show. And, you know, usually when you show up at the trade show for coatings or flooring, there's about 20 to about 40 vendors. We were the only one, wow. right? Why? So, because no one has had caught on to this market as emerging. People were raising money and building facilities, but these companies, you know, in this space are very, very large. So they're very slow and very conservative when tackling some of these newer markets. So we, we luck, right? We had a window. We went in. We were wow. the only booth. Imagine 150 contractor businesses lined up at a booth with no free stuff or no celebrities. And we had to line them up for the time and to pitch them just to get through. And it helped us pivot out. And flooring is very closely linked to roofing in terms of decision makers. So we started to get interest from the roofing side that said, hey, we need something with higher adhesion with these properties because you know, the current technologies are not up to it. And we're a little skeptical because, you know, being part of a company that, you know, launches products and does feasibilities, we're like, we need to test this. 
So we did a lot of trials. We went to the biggest skeptical people in the industry to see if we can convince them. That's, that's one of the ways you test. You go to the highest profile and you go to the 40 year veterans and you try to convince them and you see if you have something. And you know, we, over a couple of years, we were able to do it and said, okay, well, there, there's something here. There's a market need, need here. How long have you been trying to conquer the roofing? Um, well, we, we've been, you know, since when we transitioned to flooring, we, we got into earth, uh, earth. roofing uh, pretty much right away, but we, we slowly got in because there was all these things that, as an outsider at that point, didn't make any sense. Like the way that mar uh, warranties are used for marketing didn't make sense for us until we really understood how it worked. So um, what do you think about roofing warranties? I think it's a touchy subject, right? I it think, is. you know, um, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, statements and stuff that are, are concerning. But I think the industry has kind of boxed, its, boxed itself in the corner. And, you know, I wish there was a wholesale way where everyone can press the reset button. But there's some precedents definitely in the market that, you know, that causes concern for people. So I understand both sides. So would you say we have quite a few false claims <laughs> in the industry? Uh, I'm not going to name any names. We're not going to get you in trouble. But it is it is the roofers talk, and the roofers talk about it. The roofers don't like to sell those warranties. We call out on this channel. I call every single asphalt shingle manufacturer. Like, hey, yeah. go back to reasonable warranty. Yeah. And if you guys are watching it, we're going to keep calling you out, and we will name names. Not when I have guests in the studio, but I love to hear this kind of feedback that. People are not stupid. They're not dumb. You know, smart yeah. people think, and you know, there is no logic in those warranties. Yeah, I mean, you know, you try to keep everything reasonable, and you know, you do your best, and that's that's what we le learned. And I think what I'm trying to do is learn from people like you and people like you know, other people in the industry, and try my best to to you know promote the the positive aspects to uh, roofing and align myself with people that you know. What do you see is trending right now as far as coating goes or yeah. like which category is has the most potential and what goes away? Yeah, I mean, obviously higher, more higher performance coatings, um, you know, chemical compatibilities. I think, you know, the, in the past there was such an emphasis on convenience that I think some of the technologies went too far with convenience and realized that they, you know, with all these sort of changes, you see with the climate and you know weather that is you know, trending these days that some of these technologies no longer withstanding some of the uh, elements that have changed since they were originally developed. So I think you're going to see higher performance coatings. I think you're going to see a more emphasis on lighter colored coatings or cool roof uh, things that come in jurisdictions. I think you know codes and things will will happen along those ways. And I think sustainability and alignment to economics. Right? The technology is out there. It doesn't need to be us. You know, the, 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 the manufacturers ha see the examples of sustainable products that have less of an impact that, allow, that allows the contractor to make money. So uh, you know, it doesn't need to be us that grows this and changes this for everyone. I would you know, welcome every manufacturer to really push the, all of that stuff to the next level because the technology is out there. Uh, and I think you know, sometimes it's on the shelf Till they need to bring it out, and I I know some of these things sit in R and D departments, and you know I, you know, but I welcome that change because you know what, um, you know, there's so, so many things we can do proactively to to make things better for everyone. Let's talk briefly about uh, marketing those products. Commercial roofing is pretty boring. Mm -hmm. uh, what separates you, and how do you these days to share your story? We have TikToks. You are king of LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. What's the secret of marketing? Um, I, I think mar with marketing, you have to keep changing things up. You have to keep things interesting. You have to keep testing things. And I think what I always like to do is look at other industries. I think those are the clues. There's many things that don't happen in the roofing industry that readily happen in other industries. So I try to join those groups, engage um, you know, people that are doing new things. And even if I'm not sure if they're relevant, I'll try it. Right. Because if I know something before someone else, then that gives me a competitive advantage. And here's an example. I was on LinkedIn in 2004 and you know, I was one of the earliest adopters outside Silicon Valley. It was just around roughly around a million users at the time. There's hundreds of millions now, you know, 
There's two ways that you can get an edge or be an expert. You can take something that's new and run as fast as you can, or you can spend 20 years in trying to become an expert. I think it's, it's important to do both, but the advantages of getting on something new to see if you can make something of it and connect the dots. You don't want to be three years early, but try to get 15, 30 minutes early in on it and go work hard. And I think that those are the greatest examples. So going back to my LinkedIn story. So 2004, I was the only LinkedIn person in Canada that they had on the advisory board at LinkedIn. They're asking me on feedback on what they should do. And uh, I, so I became like a small, in a small way, an expert. So they could, they could not find an expert because people are trying to figure out LinkedIn. So I always got the call. I was a horrible speaker, but I did about 30, 40 speeches because they couldn't find anyone else. You know, there was groups that were all women entrepreneurs. They usually preferred to find women speakers. Mm. They brought me in. They couldn't find anyone. When I, I met someone on there that, you know, uh, was a publisher. He has thousands of books now, but it was on his 10th one, but he was an early adopter. He helped us create our very small book, and his, he was friends with Steve Wozniak, which gave us a testimonial for the book. So, wow. uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, I didn't plan this. It wasn't genius. It just, you know, when you go out there and you try to meet cool people and try things, you also meet, um, you know, uh, opportunities that, you know, may not be uh, available, but you have to be willing to make a fool of yourself and make a bunch of mistakes and be okay with that and laugh about it. Uh, but uh, somewhere in there, you'll get rewarded with some sort of opportunity that you can then take into your marketing that, you know, maybe six months or a year now, there'll be articles about, but the, the time that you implement, you'll be early. What's your take on the TikTok then? I think TikTok, for me right now, I think it's extremely good to learn, um, you know, how video is going to become more interactive, right? People are posting videos, they're responding by video. The, the, there was attempts to do this before. I, I think there's a, there's a very, very good mechanism to doing that. Now, bundling the tools and making them so easy to create videos, um, is genius for these social platforms, right? So the bar gets easier and easier in terms of syncing music. And as those tools get easier, then it's, it's, it's gonna be like a tool like writing, right? They're gonna start teaching in class. We're editing basic video using these enhanced tools, these AI tools that design for you, that edit for you, right? Like, a, you know, we put a paintbrush, things disappear on the screen, you know? You have to learn how to do that, right? Um, you have to learn how to communicate through that medium and change it up so that, you know, people are always guessing, are interested in what you're doing. And like you said, you know, we created that cooking show that one time, but every, you know, every once in a while, we have to recreate and come up with the next cooking show and then the next cooking show type idea. And I think you can make that a fun thing and experiment with that and, you don't have to do the boxy thing where you just focus on reviews and stuff like that. I think let your creativity speak. And the worst thing that can happen is no one notices and no one responds, right? So I love, <laughs> I, I love the sound of it. You make it sound so easy, but you are very passionate about marketing and branding uh, and ideas, creativity. What do you say, what do you answer to person who says that he's not a marketer? He doesn't like social media. He's not. In, I met someone today. Uh, I asked him if he's on Facebook or YouTube. He's like, I don't have none of that. What do you tell the business owner who doesn't want to be on camera or doesn't want to try new things and new yeah, platforms? Yeah, sure. I, you know, the thing that I tell th those individuals is if they run a business, they usually have at least one person, right? They probably don't know about it that's good at social. And they, you know, some, sometimes when you ask, when they ask, there's someone that has like, you know, 10,000 followers on another platform on a personal thing, but no one's bothered to ask. And if you ask that person, give them a small promotion and give them some leeway, great things happen. But I mean, especially these large organizations, there's always someone that has a YouTube channel. So it could be cars. anyone in the company who can do it. The owner doesn't have to do it. Yeah but you have to get involved and support it, mm -hmm. right? So you have to allow it to happen. You have to allow the participation to happen, but let them lead and, and uh, guide. But 
make the effort to find someone close to you in your organization. Almost always there's someone that has the ability to do it or is already doing it. How much of your success in the boring commercial coding industry you give to social engagement versus other traditional forms of marketing? What else do you do? I, I think it works together, right? The, the demos and stuff, I, the interlink, uh, how they interconnect uh, is very important, right? You do a demo, you post it on social, you get an opportunity, you feed it over there. I think, you know, events like this, we're, we're, we were going to Roofing Expo, right? Before, people would go to one of those things to meet people. That's great. But I think where social media comes in is you, you hyper-target the people you want to meet and then you solidify those relationships face to face, right? So I think that's, that's the thinking, because like, if you randomly go to a show and you think you're trying to get something out of it, you don't know who's there, who's not there. So it's using those tools to augment, not replace, but augment your efforts, right? Mm -hmm. And you, you know this very well with your things. You know, if you put content out there, wh whether someone is helping you do it or not, when people meet you, they already feel like they know you and you have a leg up, right? Where you get past the initial uh, conversation because they know who you're about and stuff. And I think that's, that's very useful. And I think it really depends how big the contractor wants to be. If they're very you know, conf confident or comfortable in the, where they are currently, then maybe they don't need to do this thing, right? They'll, they'll sort of you know, fade off into the sunset. But I always notice that people that want to grow, right? There's three buckets, right? There's demand generation. There's operations, which is, you know, keeping your team happy, your customers happy, and doing it profitably. But how do you compete with someone that has a reach? Like, you know, it's networking on steroids, right? So if you're not willing to do that, you will eventually be out-competed by someone that is using these tools that's 10xing, 100xing their, their time and their effort. So, I mean, for the contractors that's listening to that's, that's on the fence of it, Life is better on the other side, you know, listening to people like you, Dimitri, and, you know, the leverage you get, you know, it, you know, is far outweighs the initial awkwardness. And once you start doing it, you're going to be wondering why I didn't do it sooner. And the great thing is there's a ton of people that can help you and make it easy. I want to finish on this note. Um, they say the definition of stupidity is to keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect different results. What do you see that roofing companies, roofing business owners are doing the same thing? Maybe products they install, maybe old methods that clearly don't work or don't have future, but people are still doing it, repeating it. And you clearly see it's going away in 20 years. It's not going to be there. What's dying or have to die in the roofing industry? Yeah, I think, well, the way to think about it is it's not all or none today, right? Mm -hmm. You can experiment with it, get comfortable with it, and you know take a portfolio approach and allow things to play itself out because you know um, there's so many opportunities to do that and allow people within your organization that have that mindset that are comfortable with that stuff to thrive and then you know use their leadership and take their momentum after they have that proof of concept and take that to the next level. So it doesn't mean that you have to let go of everything that you hold dearly. You just have to create space for those things to occur so that you can see them play out and you can see if it's right for your organization. I see. What I really meant is we have traditional, you know, like products, for example, and I see, I, here's what I do see. I see, uh, for example, with the coatings, I see guys picking up new line, new product and killing it, selling millions of dollars before no one else did like or it could be something like roof max yeah. like rejuvenation products right yeah. and i have guys who are skeptical about everything they do the same thing over and over again until they cannot get shingles yeah <laughs> you know yeah i mean i mean that's like anything innovation right change is constant so if you're looking at your organization and you haven't changed things for a, a long time then there's a very very good chance actually almost a hundred percent chance something is falling apart something is coming out of alignment someone told me once last day that entrepreneurship is the process of systemizing things and then messing things up and then systemizing things and messing things up so if you're not shaking things up every once in a while then you're you're losing touch love it give advice to the contractor who just started the business and it's their first year 
Well, I mean, you know, I'm not the contract expert, but what I, I see with other people that are doing is I, what I did was get a mentor. Get a mentor that cares about you, that you care about them. And, you know, that's amazing things that are happening. On top of that, of course, read. But if you have a great mentor relationship, and if you're thinking in your head, why would someone help you? Well, I don't know. I had those same thoughts, you know, when I was helping someone that has done such amazing things. And, you know, gave me my first chance when I really didn't feel like I believed it. Well, I realize now someone gave that person their first chance too. So, you know, just ask and, you know, you have nothing to lose. Awesome. Thank you so much. It was great.